One cleric has asked, quote, do the Gospels really worry about supporting a nuclear family? And shouldn't those removed from the world, referring to the monastics, refrain from declarations on marriage and family, end quote? Well, the first point is so ridiculous, it's almost not worth responding to. In terms of the second point, I immediately think of St. John Chrysostom. After completing his education, he entered into monastic life, and he's the author of the great treatise on marriage and family life. Marriage is sacred, and it must be kept so. It's a crown of glory, which never fades. The task for a married man is very simple. He must love his wife, the same way Christ loved and gave himself for him, the church. When a man fails in this basic task, he destroys holiness in his own family. And if he does not repent of this, he may come to resent holiness in families at large. Because the church is a spiritual family, and because her teachings on marriage and the sanctity of marriage are so incredibly clear, he may even come to resent the authority and the holiness of the church and her teachings. Such a man ultimately cannot handle a moral authority or a moral agency outside of himself. And in a deep-seated pride, a self-blinding pride will come to believe that no one is above reproach but himself. And in thus doing this, he really comes to resent holiness in every manifestation, including and especially the family. There is nothing which is sacred and everything which is open to be made profane. And this is done out of contempt and cynicism for the holiness which he destroyed in himself and in his own family. This same cleric insinuated the abbots on Mount Athos are, quote, anachronistic and hypocritical, claiming the church appears, quote, primitive, that it has, quote, backed itself into a corner, and that the church has engaged in, quote, outdated monologue suggested that the church will be, quote, yet again caught on the wrong side of history. He also suggested the church is out of touch with, quote, reality and the world. Is this true? No, it's not true. It's patently false. It's absurd. To be sure, we are all sinners. In fact, I am chief among them. But the problem with the persistent and hardened pride is that it forecloses on the possibility of medanya, of a change of mind, of a sort of second baptism, as it were, that stems from true repentance. This pride movement is not progressive. That's what's being described here. What it really is, is it's the antithesis of millennia of the church's teaching. The church, you see, was built first with the blood of Christ, then the blood of the martyrs and the saints. It is holy. We understand love to be self-sacrificial. The so-called pride movement is hyper-narcissistic. It's turned in on itself. It's in fact so proud that it would cause a man even to denigrate, to criticize, to look down upon an entire class of men, monks and holy monasteries, hierarchs, presbyters, anyone with an opinion other than his own. And this is dangerous because the social norming of pride really causes the youth to have a sort of spiritual carterization. They begin to think that an inward directed self-love is somehow superior to what love actually is. And this is a false teaching. It also forecloses on the possibility of those in this state from understanding a sort of beautiful ecstasis of theoerota stand outside of oneself, to recognize and understand the joy that comes from agency in God's creation. And this stems only from holy matrimony. But this cleric has spoken about the, quote, grievous discrimination and suggested that, quote, lay and non-religious people ultimately reveal greater understanding for and solidarity with those disproportionately spurned and marginalized, causing the, 
quote, religious or spiritual persons to seem, quote, paradoxical and pitiful in comparison, referring to the LGBTQ community as, quote, discriminated against and ostracized. Well, that's certainly a glossolalia-like babel. It's the fruit of scholastic theology. It, and uh, even those septicis theologias, to be sure. It's a cheap substitute for orthodoxy. It is the instrumentalization of theology, in my opinion, for a cynical and contemptuous person. And we have to ask ourselves, is this group within our society really disproportionately spurned and ostracized? If anyone is spurned and ostracized, it's a sin, to be sure. But the way I see it, this has become the most protected and privileged group in our society. Now, was that the case 40 or 50 or 60 years ago? I don't think so. But why would we twist reality today if it were not for a political or an ideological end? And why would we promote so heavily this idea that these folks are victims? And is it really for the sake of civil marriages as it's euphemistically coined in this case? I think if that's the case, if we are to blur the lines between marriage and this homosexual conduct, we ought to at least look at statistics. And one of the most authoritative studies ever conducted on issues of fidelity and promiscuity amongst the homosexual population was conducted by Bell and Weinberg. And in those studies, they reveal something quite remarkable. They reveal that 43% of the respondents, the homosexual respondents in that study, reported having 500 or more sexual partners during their lifetime. A full 28% reported 1,000 or more. Just wrap your mind around that for a moment. Even the wildest frat boy would blush. 79% of the homosexual respondents in that study said that 50% or more of their partners were complete strangers. There's an extremely low rate of fidelity among this cohort as well. The study showed that just 4.5% of homosexual men in their marriages were had fidelity to their partners or to their spouse. This did not compare favorably to the heterosexual cohort, which was also studied, which reported that 85% of female respondents in marriages had fidelity to their partners, and amongst the men, it was 75.5%. So these statistics, again, are extremely authoritative. They're secular studies. They're taken completely outside the context of the church or any religious uh, institution for that matter. So I think that they reflect the fallacy uh, that there can be an association between homosexuality and even the most base secular understanding or definition of marriage and even completely outside the religious context, whether you're a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, or a Buddhist, whether you're a persistent agnostic or an atheist. So why would these ideologies be put forth? Well, I think I know this type, and they're typically effeminate men. I believe they resent the spirit of masculinity, perhaps because they've lost it themselves. But to suggest that there is no such thing as a spirit of the masculine and the spirit of the feminine is a lie. There are two sexes, two genders. They're complementary to one another. They are the basis of marriage. They are the basis of participating in an agency in God's creation and the magnificent joy that springs forth from that. I believe that they resent the masculine because they've destroyed it in themselves. They resent hierarchy, often referring to patriarchy as toxic or masculinity as toxic, quote unquote. Why? They accept hierarchy in every other aspect of life, in their sports teams, in their workplace. But within the family, somehow a patriarchy is inherently misguided, somehow wrong. And yet, when we see a family where the father is removed, we see that the children suffer. And I don't mean suffer just because one of the parents is gone. They often succumb to depression or anxiety or substance abuse or worse yet, criminal behavior 
those statistics are also irrefutable. And yet we have come to a point in our society where we put men down and we do it supposedly and purportedly in the name of exalting women. But this movement does not exalt women. It does not exalt the feminine. God made women beautiful, all of them beautiful. What could be more insulting to a woman than to tell her, I choose another man? Does that extol her virtue? See, a woman can do something quite extraordinary that a man cannot. She can bear a child, and a woman alone can bear a child. There can be no question that they are honored universally. When you see a sports player who wins a big game, who do they refer to afterwards? Their mother. The mothers hold a special place in the family cosmos, just as the father does. So when I see this ideology, I do not see a love of beauty. I see a love of what is ugly. There is no philokalia. There is no appreciation or love of beauty itself as manifest in the feminine, in a woman. And we have to ask ourselves, at a minimum, why would a person almost single-mindedly push this ideology? Is it because they've destroyed the masculine in their own life? Do they resent a woman? Do they resent womanhood? What message do they send to young men? Ought the message not to be, grow to be a man in the image and likeness of Christ? Lead your family, lead your wife and your children. And what do I mean by lead? I mean be willing to be sacrificed, be willing to be crucified, be willing to die for the ones you love, because that is what a man does this talk, all of this talk about alienation and scorn and, and pride and marginalization and homosexual marriage and rights, this is the talk of a boy, not a man.